Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome to the editorial edge for the 13th of September. My name is uh, Bhuvan Apurvaja, and I welcome each one of you, those who are joining me live and those who will be watching this over the course of the day. Okay. Uh, we have three important topics. One that uh, has been discussed previously, but you will find if you just open today's Indian Express, you will find that news prominently featured. Okay. So we'll take a look at uh, the articles. Let's, let's have a look. Number one. First, we'll take a look at the Fanigiri artifacts. Now, these have been uh, in the news. Why? Firstly, we have to understand that, uh, say, uh, artifacts and the related structures associated with them are of prime importance to us. Okay. So, we'll take a look at the Fanigiri artifacts related to Buddhism and we'll seek to understand how is it, say, uh, what are the different, firstly, constituents of it and what is the way forward? What is exactly the news regarding, uh, say, uh, the Fanigiri artifacts? Second, Eastern Economic Forum in Vladivostok, Russia. We have a minister who is uh, participating in this meeting. Okay, and at a time when say Russia is uh, under a lot of pressure from the West, okay, and that its avenues of collaboration with international partners is limited, you find that the Eastern Economic Forum is of prime importance to Russia, and India is well, a part of the meeting. So what is it firstly? What is the meeting about? What is the meeting seeking to address? And what are India's interests in say the Eastern economic framework? Right. Next, we'll take a look at the stitched ship Tankai shipbuilding. Now this has been discussed previously, but we'll seek to understand, well, what is the progress regarding that? What is the update regarding that particular information? Because once again, from the examination perspective, current affairs has to be updated on a frequent basis. Okay, so that you have the latest information with you. So we'll take a look at the Tankai method of shipbuilding, right? Okay, Jaren, your neighbor, life more than coder, bulbul, kalyan, swati. Thank you, thank you all of you for joining. Thank you so much. Good morning to all of you. All right, let's begin then. So this is my uh, Instagram ID. Now I have a lot of students who are connecting with me regarding their doubts, strategy, and I'm more than happy, in fact, grateful for their doubts. Okay, because then that keeps uh, educators like me on my toes. So go ahead. If you have any particular doubt or if you have any particular strategy related guidance that you might so require, I'm available on my uh, Telegram and Instagram handle. Okay. And uh, the whole lecture, the PDF of this, well, you'll find it on my Insta, sorry, my Telegram uh, handle. And what you'll find is that we're a small community. Okay. Which is why I focus or just on say the relevant bits of information. Because once again, what you realize is that for, a, for an aspirant, the plethora of information often leads to a lot of confusion. Okay, so uh, go ahead, connect with me here. You will see that there is no spamming. Okay, firstly, and we just look to get uh, and produce that sort of information that is required for you from the examination perspective, both prelims and mains. Right. Okay, let's get started then. The first topic that I have for you, the Fanigiri artifacts. Now, what you realize is that the Fanigiri Buddhist site, firstly, what does Fanigiri mean? It means the hood of the snake. Okay, the hood of the snake is the literal translation of Fanigiri in, in the local language. Now, this is near Hyderabad in Surya Pit, around 40 kilometers from Hyderabad, where you have this Fanigiri Buddhist site. And it is one of the most important Buddhist iconography or Buddhist sites in recent times. Okay, so let's understand first. The Fanigiri Gutta, where most of the discoveries related to early Buddhism were made. Now that provides us a lot of information and insights into say how Buddhism developed in India. Okay, up until now, say you understand that okay, a lot of the sites probably would be say concentrated in northern India. However, the, the importance of Fanigiri uh, artifacts has to be understood in correlation to Sanchi, and so we'll understand that too. Okay, now these artifacts, the one that you see here, and well, if you notice that well, it is being dug. Yes, these two gentlemen digging it. Why are they digging it? We'll seek to understand that too. So these artifacts were discovered in 1942 and currently they are being sent to the New York Met, the museum in New York for a display. They will be there up till 2025, post which they will come back to India. Okay, so the Fanigiri artifacts become important for us to consider. The artifacts closely related to the stupa complexes at Amravati and Nagarjuna Konda now, these Fanigiri artifacts, the most important bit from the examination perspective, 
that they include something called the Turanas. What exactly are Turanas? Have a look at this. Do you see this elevated archway? Yes, this elevated archway that you see. If you have been to say Sanchi, okay, in Madhya Pradesh, you will find that this is avail this is prominently visible there. So, what are Turanas? The elevated archway that you find uh, near a Buddhist uh, sacred site. Okay, very very important from the examination perspective, especially from the MCQs. So now the Turanas discovered are Fanigiri are extremely important. Why? Firstly, because they are among the first found south of Sanchi. Sanchi, which is in Madhya Pradesh. Up until now, you found that well, the Turanas at Sanchi in Madhya Pradesh was the southernmost in the Indian uh, ge geography where you found these Turanas. Okay, but the Fanigiri artifacts now give us the information that yes, Buddhism did go southern. It did go south, and well. You had, say, pillars that were erected and this elevated archways that were also erected. Okay, extremely important from the examination perspective. They are also known as Vandana Malikas. These elevated archways, once again, <coughs> are known as Turanas. Now, what do they contain? These panels that you see here, yes, these panels that you see here, they give us information that they depict both the Mahayana and the Hinayana school of thought which means that you had the coexistence of these two sects of Buddhism in India. That the amalgamation of these two sects was visible and that both of them were thriving besides each other. Okay, This is extremely important up until now. Why? Because you have had sites which are say purely of the Mahayana school of thought or you have had sites which depict the Hinayana school of thought. But in terms of the Fanigri artifacts, you find that it is one of the first prominent places where you find both Mahayana and Hinayana coexisting side by side. Okay, once again, Surya Pet, Telangana. So they contain panels, like I told you, Mahayana and Hinayana. And one of the highlights of the funny Greek find is the carving of the Buddha. What he appears to be wearing is a Roman toga with folds. Have a look at this photo now. So do you see this? Yes. These folds that you see, that you often associate with, say, the Roman uh, uh, nobility, right? You must have seen in your movies that the Romans wear something that goes almost like draped like a sari, if I may say so. Okay. So, this is the probably the only place in India where you find that Lord Buddha is wearing what appears to be a Roman toga with folds. Extremely important once again. Pranjal, good morning. Good morning. Pulbul, you are absolutely correct. Entry gate. Okay. So, the artifacts from Fanigiri now scheduled to return to India by 2025. They are obviously headed to the New York Mets, okay, where they are going to be showcased to the general public there. Okay. From the examination perspective now, what are you supposed to remember from this discussion? Firstly, understand about Sachi. Okay. Because again, you find that the Toranas here are the first instance south of Sachi, where you find the coexistence of Mahayana and Hinayana, which means Number two, a comparative analysis of Mahayana and Hinayana would be desired. And at the same time, number three, you are also looking at the concept of Turanas. Okay. Now, let's look at the questions that I have for you. Okay. Question one. And what I suggest is, guys, I have around, say, seven questions. Say one, two, seven. As you have been doing so far, answer them in the comment box. Okay. Now, what the whole point of this discussion is? I give you the introduction to the discussion, you understand the key concepts related to the discussion and then devote say 5 to 10 minutes of extra research going and solving these questions which will see you say compound your current affairs knowledge over a period of time. Okay, So let's look at this question. Sachi Stupa was commissioned by King Ashok, true or false? Okay, The four lions at Sachi have been adopted as state emblem of India, true or false? Now if you go ahead and have a look at the four lions that are so present, okay, you find that, well, you have them at Sachi, you also find them at Sarnath, right? So, go ahead, let me know which one is, uh, has been adopted as the state emblem of India. Is it Sachi or it's Sarnath? Okay, I've given you a very major hint there, by the way. All right. And Sachi Stupa is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Is it or is it not? You will let me know the answers. The incorrect statements is to be identified from these three. Let's look at question two. So, which of the above best describes Turana in Buddhism? 
royal coin state emblem elevated arch or the king's armory well the answer is obvious but from the examination perspective you can understand that if this is asked in isolation it could be a tricky question to consider given the vast amount of information that you are supposed to remember on the day of the examination okay so have a look at this question and the third one tripitakas let's understand this now tripitakas have they been written in prakrit language or pali language understand that let me know and vinayaka pitaka and abhidhamma pitaka are they the only constituents of the tripitakas or am i missing something okay you will identify the incorrect statements for me and let me know your answers in the comment box right ladies and gentlemen that concludes the first part of my discussion now for those of you who are appearing for the civil services examination in the year 2025 okay which is the year after next well go ahead have a look at this long term batch that is headed your way starting on the 16th of september an evening batch 6 pm and because again this is a long term batch you will see that the whole focus is on holistic understanding for a student okay up until now you we have had students who have associated preparing for 2025 but associated with the normal batches however there needs to be a a, a differentiation in sort in, in the preparation if you are preparing for 2024 and 2025 okay the approach needs to be slightly tweaked so go ahead have a look at the course deliverables you will find the sign up link in the comment box the description box below and when you do decide to sign up well make sure that you are using the code ba live because well that assures that you get a discount plus i am a part of your discussion your whole learning process that goes on for say the next 18 to 24 months okay now my friends the next topic eastern economic forum in vladivostok russia okay so the union minister of ports shipping waterways sarbananda sonowal the former chief minister of assam now he is currently attending the eastern economic forum meeting in vladivostok russia now please understand that this comes at a time when russia is under immense pressure from the western nations at least from the west for sure okay a lot of pressure from the western nations and that has translated into say lack of opportunities investment avenues collaborations learning okay all of that right now is at a pause for russia which means at this particular time to have the eastern economic forum meeting what you find is that india is among the few nations that are engaging on a parallel basis with the western nations and on a parallel basis with russia okay and why is india able to do that well because again the whole concept of multilateralism multipolar polar world plus obviously are looking at india looking at her own interests russia has been a close ally for several decades and so india wants to make sure that that relationship is safeguarded and one of the primary ways you do that is to go and engage with them when these kind of summits and meetings happen okay so let's look at it <coughs> excuse me so the eastern economic forum established in 2015 by a decree by the president then president putin he is uh, he went ahead with this whole concept of the eastern economic forum to support the economic development of russia's far east this was the whole area okay now if you have been say reading your geography you will realize that the russian far east say bordering bering strait is of prime importance to russia given what you find is that this entire area my friends this entire area right from say the bering strait up until norway is now slowly but steadily opening for trade this is also known as the north eastern passage okay now how is it opening for trade well because you have climate change you have thinning of ice you have technology now that so exists the ice breaker ships that are used by russia russia has a lot of say expertise in uh, operating these ice breaker ships okay so this north eastern passage now slowly but steadily opening up as a result of say the consequences of climate change what you find is that russia finds itself at an inherent advantage and thus the entire world is now looking to go ahead and use this route because again it's shorter you don't have to go through the entire coast of say cape of good hope okay that you don't have to circumvent the african continent or say go through the suez canal you are, this is a shorter route again if you want to go ahead and connect with the european uh, world okay and which is why 
that uh, the Eastern Economic Forum has become important. So let's look at the topics one by one now. So a key international platform for establishing and strengthening ties within the Russian and global investment communities. Especially, this is where India's interests lie. We'll also discuss what exactly are the point-to-point, -point, say, uh, factors that India is looking to harness out of this. Okay, but primary, please understand this, that this whole point of this Eastern Economic Forum is to do with the development of this particular area, investment opportunities that Russia wants by engaging with countries, giving them opportunities for collaboration. Okay. <coughs> so, evaluation of the economic potential of the Russian Far East, the investment opportunities and business conditions, especially in the light of the Russia-Ukraine crisis, where Russia is under a lot of international pressure. Okay, that say avenues of collaboration and engagement are very limited for them, which is why the Eastern Economic Forum becomes important. Now, in terms of the examination perspective, given that the Vladivostok area is of prime importance, and that the northeastern passage that I just introduced to you is again an important part. Okay, up until now, so you had the northwestern passage wherein you would go and circumvent the coast of Greenland near Canada, and then finally enter from say uh, uh, just north, just south of uh, the northern American continent. Okay, now that also has seen opening. Why? Same reasons: climate change, thinning of ice. All that is opening up new avenues of communication. Sea lanes are opening up. But in terms of the Northeastern Passage, from the examination perspective, you would be best advised to go ahead and know about the seas that form this Northeastern Passage. Okay. So when you start from, say, the side of Norway, which is from the side of, say, the West, okay, you are looking at the first sea that comes up, the Barents Sea. Okay. Thereafter, the Kara Sea, the Laptev Sea, East Siberian Sea, and the Chukchi Sea. These five constitute my northeastern passage or northeastern route. Whereas here you have the Bering Strait, right? And you also have the two currents that meet here. Okay. Oyashio, Kuroshio. Yes. Cold current, hot current meeting. You know well, that's a primary uh, condition where you have good fishing grounds. All right. In an area of immense productivity, which is the Sea of Okhotsk. But the Sea of Okhotsk is not considered to be a part of the northeastern passage. Okay, so from the examination perspective, when you go from west to east, know about this whole alignment of seas, starting from say Barents Sea, then Kara Sea, then Laptev Sea, then East Siberian Sea, and finally the Chukchi Sea. Okay, extremely important once again, right? Make a note of this. Obviously, I'll be sharing all of this in my Telegram channel. Now, the questions that can arise from here. One way I can, you will see the question that I have for you is to do with the alignment of this. The other is to do with the productivity that you find here because of say the meeting of ocean currents. Now, if you understand that this is the prime importance, that this whole route is now opening up, okay? Up until now, it was say not accessible, which means what? That eventually this Eastern Economic Forum, because let's understand this, this entire area is under Russian control. It's a part of its territorial uh, seas. So because, again, unless and until you do not engage with the Russians, how are you going to have access to this? Which is why you find that the Indian interest here lies. Previously, we have had, say, Indian interest reflected in this area. Okay, You have had, say, uh, at the Eastern Economic Forum, India is looking to, again, expand its influence. So you're looking at, say, expanding trade. You're looking at expanding connectivity. Okay. You're looking at, say, investments. <clears throat> okay. You're looking at investments. And in the past, India has offered a line of credit. Okay. If I'm not wrong, the line of credit was close to a billion US dollars. Why? Because India wants to help build infrastructure in this area. So if India has been extending money, moral support, financial support, it only makes sense that you do not go ahead and disengage with Russia right now because the hard work has been done. Now the time to reap the benefits of that hard work has come, which is why the Union Minister Sarbananda Sonowal attending the Eastern Economic Forum meeting in Vladivostok. Now what else has been done by India for this region so far? Okay, so you are looking at say cooperation in energy. Okay, you're looking at cooperation in pharma. 
all right you are also looking at cooperation in maritime connectivity <coughs> sorry trade and tourism okay now please understand all of this right now is at a standstill for russia why once again they are under immense west uh, western pressure okay continued sanctions on them so if you see the participants of the eastern economic forum well india is among the most uh, among the prominent countries that is attending it and given that we have engaged closely with russia in the past okay that day or that thought is not uh, say far fetched if i say that well india will look to go ahead and closely integrate with india in so far as the eastern side of russia and eventually with an eye to accessing this entire route finally gaining an entry into europe is concerned okay the importance of eastern economic framework in so far as india's ambitions to be a global seafaring power can also not be say discounted for okay okay so the eastern economic forum let's go forward this is what the whole plan of action is so you will have yesterday we had the russian uh, president putin who addressed this whole meeting now look at this here open up new areas of cooperation and network with the potential business partners first among them being india okay the whole point i've given you the areas of convergence say looking at again uh, trade healthcare tourism maritime okay all of that is the uh, investment avenue that you are looking at again in the past in fact the state of gujarat and uh, the republic of sakha okay the indian state of gujarat and sakha in russia okay in previous previous years eastern economic uh, forum meetings we have had agreements between these two entities to go ahead and build the diamond industry so you see if you have already have had say nation to nation meeting if you had sub region to region meeting it's only natural that you do not disengage now at the, at this critical juncture which is why you find that india has sent a very senior minister to go ahead and attend this meeting at at a time when obviously none of the western nations are being represented here okay so extremely important once again right let's look at this this is a previous year question that i have for you from the year 2015 let's look at this india is a member of which of the following now i do not give you options here okay this has obviously multiple correct or multiple incorrect okay you will let me know which of these but why do i not give any options well because uh, given that the whole uh, unpredictable nature of the upsc examination all right you had this year where the options were completely changed which is why i suggest that for a student you develop the ability to solve a question without options okay so let's look at this india is a member of which of the following option a asia pacific economic cooperation b association of southeast asian nations and c east asia summit right you let me know the answers to this in the comment box and finally the question that you should absolutely prepare for okay in fact what i suggest is that once you have figured out the west to east orientation of these seas also go ahead and spend 5 minutes on the straits in this area okay so you have one i have already told you about the bering strait you also have the other straits that are present here have a look at them okay we'll be discussing the straits of the northeastern passage in detail in the coming classes right so arrange from west to east kara sea laptev sea barents sea chukchi sea east siberian sea let me know your answers in the comment box okay so this is again my uh, telegram channel if you have any particular doubts related to what we have discussed so far go ahead and connect with me here i'll be happy to engage with you okay the third one the tangkai method now this has been in the news and obviously most of you may be aware of this if you are not well here is an introduction okay historically india has been a good uh, a very excellent seafaring nation okay we have had say kingdoms in southern india who have uh, expanded and engaged with other nations or other entities that time through the sea route which means we did develop or we did have an indigenous method of ship building because let's understand that industrial revolution was something that came to india much later in fact industrial revolution is to be understood as the prime uh, it happened primarily in the west which means the fruits of that revolution were reaped by the western nations and that could have translated into better guns better armory better ships better cannons all of that 
However, in India's case, because we did not have industrial revolution up until much later, okay, which is why you find that shipbuilding was one way where we had an indigenous craft, an indigenous technique. And this is what the Tangkai method is about. Okay? So an ancient technique of constructing a ship by stitching planks of wood using ropes, cords, coconut fibers, raisins, all of that together. You are basically going and stitching together a ship without using any metal, any nails whatsoever. Okay? Now understand the consequences of this. Obviously, this would be a sustainable method of shipbuilding. Absolutely, I agree with you there. Correct. But in terms of, say, when you compare a ship that has, say, nails, all of those materials that are used in, say, modern shipbuilding processes versus a ship that is just made of wood, well, besides the fact that there will be an obvious mismatch in their capabilities, what you also understand is that, say, if you were to launch a cannon from the nail-made ship or the metal ship, okay, the recoil of that could be handled by that ship, yes. Why? Because, again, it is able to withstand the recoil. But in terms of a wooden ship, that recoil will, could almost have catastrophic consequences for the ship. Okay? Which is why you find that eventually, after, say, India also had access to those sorts of technologies of modern shipbuilding, this was done away with. And currently, you find only, say, small fishing boats that use this method. However, the union government, along with, uh, say, a private partner, and represented by Ministry of Culture in collaboration with the Indian Navy. So you have three stakeholders here. You have the Culture Ministry, you have the Navy, and you have a private partner. They have come together to go ahead and revive this ancient shipbuilding technique. Okay, and so let's look at it. In the stitch method, wood planks are shaped using the traditional steaming method to conform to the shape of the hull. Each plank is stitched to other using, well, do you look at these? All sustainable materials, all naturally available materials. Okay. Over time, everyone shifted to the European nailed frame style of shipbuilding. No longer was this feasible. Why? Because eventually, as I told you, one of the primary reasons was that in a time of conflict, these ships would be found out. You could not go ahead and have cannons on them. Because the moment you fired the cannon, the recoil would be so high that this ship could probably disintegrate. Okay. <coughs> the, stip ship, the stitch ship method of shipbuilding fell out of favor around 16th century. And that's why? Because they were not suitable for the use of cannons. Okay. So let's look at this. What is the significance of the Tangkai ship building? Reviving and rejuvenation of art. Absolutely, yes. You're also looking at promoting local craftsmanship, a dying technique. Okay a dying method of shipbuilding that is now being revived in modern uh, day 21st century. And why is that? Okay. Eventually, the point is that sustainable shipping is of the importance. Especially, again, if India is looking to achieve net zero by 2017. Okay. So, shipping is one of the most, say, uh, pollution-intensive industries. It contributes close to 2.9% of global emissions. Okay. And these are just the recorded emissions, by the way. So what is just letting out in the, in the atmosphere? In terms of the discharge in the ocean water, in terms of what the products are used to make a ship, to construct a ship, and the ramifications of that once you go ahead and dismantle the ship, yes, you find that it's an extremely pollution-intensive industry. And so, if you're looking at, say, sustainable shipping, especially for, say, short-haul uh, ships, say, for local fishermen or for, say, passenger crafts, this method is going to reduce India's carbon footprint. Okay. So, let's look at it. Promoting local craftsmanship, reviving ancient trade links with the ocean littoral countries. You're looking at, obviously, engaging with, say, Indonesia. Okay. Indonesia is the prime partner in this project as the ship that is now being constructed, the Tangkai method of ship. Once constructed, they will be going to Indonesia and attending the Bali festival. Okay. The Bali festival in 2025 is being planned where these ships will go and represent India. Okay. Extremely important. Why? Because you're looking at reviving those ancient trade routes, those ancient linkages that were hitherto, say, lost. Okay. And obviously, cultural pride, a sense of pride, because again, 
we do have a rich seafaring tradition okay india is a country with a rich seafaring tradition especially if you go ahead and consider the southern empires of the choras the cheras the pandyas yes they were extremely competent ship builders seafarers and at the same time extremely competent ship dismantlers also okay so the three stages of ship building or ship uh, shipping industry need to be understood at okay let's look at this question then consider the following ship breaking yards and the locations included okay colisonia yes okay we'll have a look at your answer good good attempt theek hai do i i would consider i would actually request you go ahead and answer all the questions that i have for you you will see it will help you a lot all of you guys okay so along is it in india okay gadani is it in pakistan chitagong yes it seems like it is in bangladesh is aliaga in turkey now these are ship breaking yards okay and once again what you find is that the ship breaking yards because of all the toxic material that is used in construction of ships especially looking at say lead okay and the other materials that are there all of them together once you go ahead and dismantle a ship the ship dismantlers the individuals who go ahead and eventually dismantle the ship they are at a very high risk of uh, being exposed to these toxic materials which is why say in india's case at the along shipyard okay at the along shipyard which is in gujarat you find that the gujarat government has gone ahead and made special health provisions including the setting up of a dedicated hospital for the ship breakers so you can understand the gravity of the pollutants that are so emitted during the process of ship building right so i've given you one part of the answer but go ahead and match them for me okay is gadani in pakistan and is aliaga in turkey you will let me know right let's look at this <coughs> excuse me black water grey water ballast water from cruise ships severely affect marine ecosystems now herein is your understanding the difference between black water grey water and ballast water okay firstly yes obviously all three are pollutants no question no doubt there but what's the difference okay black water understand it in the simplest manner is something that has feces and urine okay it has human body fluids that are a part of that water eventually which means that the microbes the bacterial infection bacterias all of that are found majorly which means again that this is extremely pollutant okay what is grey water well if you go ahead and just brush your teeth for example or or take a shower or say wash your utensils anything that is bereft of these two elements but is including the other household discharge that is a part of grey water and what is ballast water well ships used to and still do make sure that they have water under their ballast why do they do that to counterbalance the buoyancy of the ocean okay because eventually if you have to float on the surface of the ocean you need a certain amount of weight on it if you do not put weight on it well it's quite likely that you will be thrown apart in rough seas okay which is why empty ships carry ballast water okay for example if you are the commander of a ship the captain of this ship that goes from say mumbai to say dubai okay or mumbai to say uh, new york for example okay so you go ahead if you are going to pick up say iphones or whatever you are looking to get from new york on the trip from say mumbai to new jersey or new york you are going to carry a lot of water inside here which you are going to discharge in new york once you want to go ahead and fill your ship with the goods that you want to bring from there which means what that the local water of mumbai a lot of uh, vo uh, volume is obviously a, a high volume all of that now getting discharged along the new york coast which means all sorts of again virus bacteria microbes all getting discharged in the new york water which means what as you have invasive species here you have invasive water which is again highly pollutant highly pollutant extremely undesired okay so you find that one of the primary ways that say a uh, Uh, international organizations look to reduce the impact of ballast water is by saying that well carry goods instead of water however that is often not feasible why because again these ships have specific checkpoints specific targets specific pickup and discharge points which means it's not always feasible to carry goods 
which is why most of the ships end up carrying ballast water. Okay. So, black water, grey water and ballast water from cruise ships severely affect marine ecosystems, yes or no? MARPOL 73 oblique 78 is an international convention to reduce pollution from ships, okay? Marine pollution, this is a resolution that was adopted. So, you will let me know whether India is a signatory to the MARPOL 73 oblique 78, okay? Identify the correct statements for me. So, these questions that I have for you 1 to 7, I would implore and request you, okay? Go ahead, answer these questions. It, you don't have to spend more than 5 to 10 minutes just researching about the basics of what we have discussed here. Okay? Right, my friends. So, before I conclude this morning's discussion, let's take a look at the questions that we had yesterday. Now, yesterday we discussed, <coughs> excuse me, yesterday we discussed Cheriel scroll paintings. Okay? A primary uh, product, a dying product that has now been rejuvenated, again by state support, by union government support. Okay. You had the spouses of the dignitaries who were visiting us during the G20 summit. They were all, in fact, some of them were given Cheriel scroll paintings. Okay. So, the Cheriel scroll paintings are scrolls made in vivid colors with red being predominantly used. Yes, what you find is that the Cheriel paintings, they showcase stories of epics, stories of uh, Puranas. And at the same time, these stories are intertwined with stories of daily life. Okay. Why? Because again, this is an art form of the masses. For example, in yesterday's class we discussed, in China, the scroll paintings were the complete uh, domain of the nobility. In India's case, the complete opposite. Okay, Which is why you find that red color was predominantly used. Again, a lot of the stories had local connotations. You had music and dance that accompanied the showcasing of these paintings to the villagers. Okay, a primary form of entertainment also making sure that the history of that time, that the local traditions, the culture of that time was uh, say, uh, put into action. You know, it was chronicled, which is why you find that uh, Cheriel scroll paintings are extremely important. <coughs> Cheriel scroll paintings seek amalgamation of tales from epics and Puranas, absolutely correct. Intertwined with seals of daily life, badia, sahi hai. And Cheriel painting scrolls are made on cotton cloth. Now, some of you have got this question incorrect, how I'll tell you. Okay, had I included the word only here, if I had word included the word only, then this would have been incorrect. Because you find that it's not just cotton, but also khadi. Okay, you also find khadi being used nowadays. However, I did not include the word only, which means this does become an incorrect a correct statement. Okay, so I, I found that many of you got this incorrect. Why? So the problem is, that when you are reading the question, in spite of you having the knowledge, okay, you need to go ahead and correlate and apply that knowledge and read the statements carefully. Most of the times, students make mistakes in answering questions. Why? Because they have not spent, say, the extra 10 seconds, 15 seconds that was needed to answer that question correctly. Okay. So, in this uh, statement, identify the incorrect statements. Well, none. None of the statements are incorrect here. But had I included the word only, then this would have been incorrect for sure. Okay, but because it's not just cotton, but also khadi that is used. Okay, all right, let's look at the next one. So, identify the incorrectly matched. Again, a question that I expected some of you to get incorrect and that's what happened again. Okay, so up until now, every book, every note will tell you that say thangka is to do with Sikkim. Yes, I'm not disputing that. But you find is that thangka is not just to do with Sikkim. You also find Thangka being made in Dharamshala, in Himachal Pradesh. Okay. You also find it being made in Arunachal Pradesh, Tibet. Okay. So, in terms of Thangka, Arunachal Pradesh is absolutely correct. Most of you have got this incorrect. Why? Because your understanding of Thangka is related or limited to just Sikkim. No. Okay. Thangka is a Buddhist icono uh, uh, iconography. It's a Buddhist form of art. And uh, the places that have say Buddhist traditions, Buddhist population, you find Thangka being made readily by the people there. Okay. Cheriel in Andhra Pradesh, no, it is in Telangana. Okay. How about Kalamkari guys? Is it Punjab? Kalamkari, yes, absolutely Sonia, you are absolutely correct. Kalamkari is to do with Andhra Pradesh. Madhubani is to do with Bihar. Okay. North Bihar, the Mithila area is where you find the uh, Madhubani paintings gaining prominence. In fact, if you have ever traveled 
from say Patna to New Delhi on on the Rajdhani that is there. Yes, the livery on the uh, coaches of the trains they showcase Madhubani painting, which is why you find that Madhubani is the uh, sole domain of the state of Bihar. Okay, so the incorrectly matched here being A, B, C. Okay, most of you have answered all, but no, Thanka is to do with uh, Arunachal Pradesh also. Let's look at this. The GI tag granted by the GI tag registry in Chennai. Yes, absolutely. But where, who does the GI tag registry report to? So it reports to the Department of <coughs> Industrial Promotion and Investment, which reports to the Ministry of Commerce. Okay, Ministry of Commerce is the nodal authority for the GI tag registry, which is headquartered in Chennai. Right. Next. The Central Water Commission was established on the recommendations of Baba Sahib Dr. Bhim Rao Ambedkar. Absolutely correct. Yes. Yes. Next, the Central Water Commission is responsible for full implementation of the Indus Water Treaty. Once again, a statement that many of you got incorrect. Okay. What you find is that for the implementation of the Indus Water Treaty, you have a permanent Indus Water Commission, an Indus Commission, and that has representatives from both the countries, India as well as Pakistan. Okay. Both countries nominate a high-grade uh, scientist with a lot of knowledge in hydrology and they are the nodal authorities from both sides who engage in so far as the implementation of the Indus Water Commission Treaty is concerned. Okay, So the Indus Water Commission is responsible for the implementation of the Indus Water Treaty, not the Central Water Commission. And the Central Water Commission reports to MOEFCC. Well, no, it reports to the Department of Jal Shakti, Ministry of Jal Shakti, Sri Gajendra Singh Shekhawat being the minister in charge of this. Okay. So the incorrect statements here being B and C. Right. Let's look at question 5. So yesterday we discussed in detail, I gave you the four indicators. Yes. If those of you who watched the class yesterday, you would have seen that we go, went ahead and gave ourselves five parameters okay, which need to be fulfilled and if you fulfill them, you either have El Nino or La Nina. Okay. So El Nino indicates low oscillation between the oceans of northern and southern hemisphere. Darwin, Tahiti. Okay. Now, if you have low oscillations, which means the variability between these two uh, places is less which means that the high pressure to low pressure circulation that you need for say uh, uh, a normal circulation or a La Nina circulation is not working. Okay, Which means low oscillations are to do with El Nino. But the measurement of this is in terms of Eastern Hemisphere and Western Hemisphere. So El Nino indicates low oscillations. Tak to sahi hai. Yes, they do indicate low oscillations, but the oceans are incorrect. Next, El Nino indicates high oscillations, well, incorrect. And El Nino coupled with negative IOD brings devastating rot to India, correct. C, right. If you do have any doubts related to El Nino, La Nina, Indian Ocean Dipole, Enzo, okay, Madden Julian oscillation, all of that. If you still have doubts, I would recommend look at the, say, uh, lecture yesterday, okay. I have explained it in the briefest form in the most succinct manner that you will remember. Okay, No passages, no paragraphs, simple diagrams and these five conditions that need to be fulfilled. Okay, Go ahead and if you still have doubts, well, you have my uh, uh, Instagram, Telegram, email ID. Reach out to me wherever you want to. I'll be more than happy to help you. Okay, Let's look at six. Strato volcanoes are known as shield volcanoes. Well, no, 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 no. They are known as composite volcanoes. Shield volcanoes what does the name signify? If they are like a shield, which means, firstly, if this is, say, from where my lava is getting out, which means my lava or my magma, as you might understand, is it less viscous? Absolutely. What is viscosity? Resistance to movement. If my lava is more viscous, which means it will refuse to go far. If my lava is less viscous, which means it will go far and wide, which means it will form a structure that is wide, which will look like a shield if you're traveling overhead. Whereas straight to volcano, more viscosity. The volcano does not want to go far and wide, for example. Here it is. 
Okay. If it is more viscous, which means it is not willing to flow far and wide, it comes up, cools down. Okay. But there is a continuous supply, which means eventually the pressure here builds so much that you have an explosive type eruption. Whereas in a shield volcano, you do not have any explosive type eruption. Why? Because the volcano, the lava that is coming out, well, it is less viscous. It is not immediately cooling down here. In fact, it is more than willing to flow far and wide, which is how you had the Deccan traps develop. Yes. So, strato volcanoes, known as shield volcanoes, no, incorrect. Plutonic igneous rocks have smaller crystals as compared to extrusive igneous rocks. The best way to remember this, okay, that the size of the crystals is codependent on the size of the rocks, which means that those that are cooling down within my earth's surface, below my earth's surface, they are not exposed to weathering or erosion. If they are not exposed to weathering and erosion, which means the size of the crystals here is higher and those rocks that are over the land, because again you have all the weathering actions on them, air, water, wind, sunlight, everything acting on them, which means the crystal size here is way, way lower. Okay, So, the plutonic igneous rocks have higher crystals as compared to extrusive igneous rocks. The intensity of an earthquake is measured on the Mercalli scale. Okay, Straightforward, NCRT, no explanation there. Now, the last one. The intensity is measured from the focus of the earthquake. Here is a brief revision for you. Okay, understand it in the simplest manner. So, if this is where your earthquake has happened, 90 degree above is your epicenter. This is my hypocenter of focus. Okay. Now, in terms of intensity, which means you're looking at looking at the scale of devastation that has so come. Okay. So, up until now, if you say if you have ever been to the USGS website, the United States Geological Survey, how do they go ahead and measure the intensity of the earthquake? They have postmaster generals who will go ahead and send telegrams to all the areas that have been say so affected and then they will look to understand the scale of devastation. Okay? The scale of devastation is to be understood, which means it is something that is happening on the surface of the earth. Okay? The surface of the earth, all the devastation that has so happened, that indicates the intensity of the earthquake, which is why you find that it is not measured from the focus, but in fact it is a, 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 a overground uh, verification that you do. Okay? So, the correct statements here being, well, one was obviously incorrect, second was obviously incorrect, none of the above. Okay? Right? So, we had these individuals, my star individuals, by the way, guys. Okay? Kalyan, Pooja, Shubham, Ulfat, Ashleka, Crystal, Be Live Facts, Anjali, Vaishnavi, Koder, Raghu, Laughter, Mandeep, Ibilda, Karuna, Pranjul, Akshay, Aditya, Rahul, Ayush and Frown Clown. Guys, thank you so much, you know. I am actually pleased to see most of you got the questions, even the tricky ones correct. Okay. In the off chance that you do got one or two questions incorrect, does not matter. The main thing is that you learn from your mistakes and don't repeat them. Okay. And for those of you who are watching this live and those who will watch me later during the course of the day, may I please implore you, answer the questions of the day. Okay. Why I am telling you this? Because eventually, question solving has to be a priority from day one. Many, question, many students shy away from solving questions. Okay, they're afraid of solving questions. Well, in that case, you shouldn't be appearing for the prelims because prelim clearing is all about solving questions. Okay, give yourself that ample opportunity to go ahead and correlate and learn from your mistakes. So, I, uh, once again, I implore you, please go ahead and answer the questions that I have presented for you today. Leave the answers for me in the comment box. And if you understood the topics that we discussed today, please do not hesitate to leave me a like. You know, it's the small motivations that an educator gets early morning. And if you would so desire, go ahead and share this with your friends too. Okay. That concludes the class for today, my friends. I'll see you tomorrow morning, once again, 6.30 a.m. And we'll take a look at another set of topics and another set of multiple choice questions for you to evaluate and answer. Okay. Till I see you tomorrow morning, 6.30. It's a wrap.